So again, uh, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's session is titled Centering Trauma and Resilience, Teaching U.S. History Through Native American Women's Voices. And I'm pleased to be joined by Rose Strimlau from uh, Davidson College and Brooke Bauer from the University of South Carolina at Lancaster. I also want to thank Jennifer Nichols for joining us tonight. Uh, Jennifer is our TA. She's a member of our current Teacher Advisory Council. And Jennifer will be dropping links into the chat box of some resources she found. She'll also be asking questions and just generally keeping things lively, as she often does. So uh, with that introduction, I want to welcome both uh, both Professor Stremlau and Bauer to the to the microphone. Um, I know you've kind of worked out together how you're going to share uh, the speaking and talking back and forth. Um, and uh, I want to thank you for spending your night with us. Thank you, Andy. We appreciate it. Um, hello, y'all. This is Rose. Um, I'm joining you from Davidson College, which is in the homeland of the Catawba. I'm originally from Chicago, which is Potawatomi homeland, and I'm going to let uh, Brooke say hello and start us on our first slide. Tanake, Niat Brooke Bauer, Ya Iswa, De Monson, I had on Hanachuri. So I said hello in my own language. My name is Brooke Bauer. I am a Catawba woman and it's very good to be here this evening. Um, I am, Catawba, like I said, I am Catawba. I live on the uh, Catawba Indian Nation uh, property in Rock, near Rock Hill, South Carolina. So it's just a little bit south of Charlotte, North Carolina, just to give you an idea of where we are. Um, so some of the components of this workshop this evening, we will talk about some best practices for teaching about Native people, um, some foundational concepts. So we'll, you know, talk a little bit about kinship, traditional families, um, traditional eco ecological knowledge, and then we'll focus on uh, trauma, resilience, and we'll open the floor to questions. So this is Rose again. I wanna jump in real quick and send a special thanks to Brooke for joining us tonight. Um, she's actually on sabbatical, working on her first book up at the American Philosophical Society. Um, and I want to close the book. It's not out yet. Um, we'll send positive vibes to Brooke as she finishes it. But it's going to be the first book about the history of Catawba women. And so that's coming to us um, in about a year or so <laughs> from the University of Alabama Press. Um, and I've read the draft of it. And, and it is amazing. And I'm so proud of Brooke. And I'm so glad she took time away from her writing to be with us tonight. Thank you, Rose. I really appreciate the plug. <laughs> so um, real quick, in talking about best practices and teaching about Native Americans, uh, one thing I would like to stress is, um, and many of you may already do this, um, refer to Native nations accurately. So if you're teaching in one region, that has a uh, one specific tribe. So, for example, in my region, it's the Catawba. Um, use their tribal name uh, rather than, you know, using Native Americans uh, because there are over 500 federally recognized tribes and more than I can't cannot count the number of state recognized tribes. And while regionally they may have some similarities, um, they also have some different uh, cultural practices. Um, and another thing is include Native people as export, experts as you're teaching your course. You might um, invite someone, a speaker from 
the tribal government or the um, cultural center or museum to come and give a short talk to your students. Um, avoid normalizing native death without um, to give the explanation of who and what caused it. Um, and another thing is acknowledge that settler colonialism is an ongoing process. It has not ended. Um, so on that hand, just kind of balance the um, ideas that natives have vanished with uh, Native American resilience, survival, and presence. So show your students in some way that uh, Native Americans are still here. Um, and so that leads you to this last point about ending the discussions in the present tense. Um, so the biggest thing is you know, while the history of Native Americans is extremely important, it's equally important to say, you know, they're here. They may stand next to you, well, maybe not during pandemic, but they may stand next to you in the grocery store. They may be a coworker. They may be a teacher. Um, so, uh, yeah. Rose, do you have anything to add? Rose, jumping back in. Thanks, Brooke. Um, so, we designed tonight's presentation to smear best practices about what, what we do, um, in particular when we're talking and educating about traumatic topics. Um, so, to ground students in something um, about the community, about the people, that gives them a sense of their full humanity. For me, when I'm teaching about Native women and I teach um, a research seminar here at Davidson College that's solely about Indigenous women, um, I begin with talking about family and kinship. And, and we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. Um, but doing that gives students a sense of not just the complexities of Indigenous civilization, but again, emphasizes the full humanity. And, and this reflects best practices from uh, trauma-informed teaching methods. Because then when I do talk about suffering and death, um, and, and Native history is often hard to talk about because of the difficulty and the complexity and the, the seriousness of so many of the events that have happened, I'm careful to do so um, using the active voice when I'm talking about acts of violence and aggression. And it's really easy, especially for those of us who are Native English speakers, um, to use the passive voice so that, you know, bad things happen to Native people, to Native women, rather than um, identifying specifically who was engaging in those activities and the reasons for that. And to echo Brooke's comment, it's important, uh, again, from the perspective of trauma-informed teaching methods, we're also acknowledging that there may be Native people in the room. Um, we can't make assumptions about our students' identities. Native people um, look like all kinds of different people. Um, and may present to you in ways that, that don't conform to stereotypes that folks often have. And so when I'm teaching, I always end with the present day. And it's, uh, it's as simple as, you know, before class, I Google and maybe I find a, a current news story. Or if I know that there's an artist or a musician or, or, or someone who is in the arts who is currently producing work, um, you know, I'm, I'm college, so I can have the students pull out their phones like, hey, look this up. What do you see here? have them go to Twitter. Like, what is this person tweeting from this community? What's happening right now? Um, and that uh, process of starting with, again, a broad perspective, the full humanity of the group, and then ending with the present day, um, it, it challenges some of the stereotypes that Brooke talked about, about erasure. Um, but for me, especially as a non-Native person who teaches this and who spent 10 years teaching in a historically Native community uh, in, in Robertson County, North Carolina, home of the Lumbee people. I'm um, not sure if anyone's joining us from southeastern North Carolina tonight. I learned that when I didn't take this effort and I didn't go um, one, two, three in those steps, that I saw my Native students changing their schools. Saw them 
um, absorb that traumatic information, whether or not it was about one of these people or another native tribe, in, in ways that they seem to diminish themselves in that class. Um, and so using these methods, um, and again, starting with the full humanity, emphasizing native people's survivance, um, is one way that we can talk about this complex history and, and do so in a way that, that cares for, in particular, the native students who may be in the room. And it's also just cool for our students to know what's going on today. A lot of my students say the most uh, interesting thing about my class is <laughs> the artists and the folks on Twitter and all the, the cool um, you know, stuff that, that I point out in, in that part of the class versus the historical content. And hey, if that's what they remember, I'll take it. Uh, Professor, I, I have a quick clarifying question uh, for you. Rose, this comes from Christine. Christine's joining us from the Bay Area in California. And she would like to know uh, what you suggest we can do about referring to nations by their preferred name if there isn't an agreed upon name. So for example, in California, uh, many tribes have two names, one from the mission uh, that they're associated with and one from pre-contact. Or, yep, uh, Brooke or Rose, either one. So, um, the one thing that I would add or would suggest, I'm not as familiar with all the California indigenous people, but I, I imagine that they prefer to use names, our original name or their original name, just like I would use the Catawba's original name of Iswan, which means river. Uh, and I add yay to the front of that, and it's the river people. Um, so that's what I would suggest. I don't know if Rose has anything different to add, but I would suggest referring to them in the way that they prefer. That seems like a, a good strategy for sure. Um, and just in terms of a little bit more clarification, you, you know, we have many educators from across the country in the audience with us tonight. Uh, I suspect that a large majority, if not all of them, are non-native uh, backgrounds. Give us just a sort of a short glossary of the appropriate and accurate naming conventions. So absolutely uh, referring to the specific tribe uh, as you can. Um, what about just generally speaking with, with the overall term? Uh, what, what is appropriate to use? Is it Native American? Is it American Indian? Is it Native? What, what, what do you suggest uh, in the broadest of senses teachers should use most accurately? This is Rose jumping in. Um, to, to echo what Brooke said, if I can determine how folks want to be called, of course, that's the term I use. Um, on the resources list that we shared with you all, there is a link to the National Congress of American Indians, which is the largest um, representative uh, organization of indigenous peoples in the United States today. Um, and their index is useful both in identifying uh, native communities in, in your region and in your state, but also links to their web pages. Um, I, I know at the college level, I often tell students to avoid Wikipedia, but it's actually really good for this purpose. Because Wikipedia pages, if you scroll down, almost always have a link uh, to the Native Nations homepage. And many Native Nations will have um, a section about their history or culture in which they may talk about um, their naming preferences. So as Brooke said, um, their names for themselves and also the names that uh, they've been referred to by outsiders and, and the name they may be referred to today by the U.S. government. Um, when, when names are um, not consistent, I talk about that with my students because I think it is an important issue and it's one that reminds us that just as our students have their naming preferences, their pronoun preferences, um, and these are evolving and ongoing in the lives of individuals we care about in our classrooms. This is true for Native nations too. Um, so the, the debate, the question itself can be a useful teaching tool. As for which umbrella term to use, um, I tend to, in my classes, use indigenous because I, at this point in, in teaching, I'm trying to draw in information, not just from native communities in what's now the United States, 
but um, English uh, language material, so including Canada, Australia, New Zealand um, in particular as well. And so indigenous then is an umbrella term that refers to um, the peoples whose ancestors were present before the arrival of settlers. And, and it's used um, globally in nations that are predominantly English speaking now. That being said, Native American and American Indian are both useful terms. Historically, they are very different terms in the sense that American Indian is the official legal term that's used by the United States government. So um, if you're a, a, a legal wonk and you go back and you read everything from um, uh, materials written by the founding fathers about their understanding of British failures in Indian policy to the ways that Native peoples were conceptualized as uh, enemies on the border, and in some cases, enemies within, um, in the first about 30 years of American political writing, they use the term American Indian. That's the term in the Constitution. That's the term um, that means something very specific in terms of the relationship of these peoples with the United States government. Native American as a term emerges in the mid 20th century, and it comes from a couple different places. One of them is from the United States government, in that by the mid 20th century, the United States has expanded its sovereignty um, into Alaska, into the Pacific, and there are other indigenous peoples who are different from those of the 48 contiguous states that, that need grouping together for uh, purposes of the census, for purposes of essentially folks in DC counting people for policy decisions. So Native American gets used in um, government circles beginning in the mid 20th century for that purpose. And about the same time, there are also uh, scholars who will be the, the founding generation of what's now American Indian, Native American and Indigenous Studies program who are calling this terminology of American Indian into question. And many of them tend to gravitate towards Native American. Um, it's, it's a preference for them that it is a, a more respectful and inclusive term, largely because it's not American Indian. So it's at about the same point, um, post-World War II, Cold War, where this is a term being used, Native American, in government circles, but also increasingly at that point used um, by the media. Um, for myself, again, I often use indigenous because I like to remind my students that modern day uh, national boundaries are a social construct, um, but also it's because what a lot of the scholarship that they are reading in my classes uses. So that term indigenous is something we're very familiar with. Um, for other folks, it may be that Native American is the, the umbrella term used by, by people in their region um, from uh, Native communities, and in which case, you know, use that term. Um, I, I always try to balance um, what will be familiar and legible to my students with what is the preference of Native people that, that they may encounter, as Brooke said, at work in the grocery store uh, in their social circle. Fantastic, thank you so much. All right, so I'm gonna jump into the next slide then, and we're gonna take just a couple of minutes to talk about um, one of the most central and important concepts to understanding Native women's experiences. Uh, and as I said, a, a best practice for thinking about how to teach the difficult topics in Native history is, is to not start with the difficult stuff, but to start with the stuff that gives us a full and a comprehensive sense of how people in the past in Native communities, and still in many, many Native communities today, understood their humanity. Um, and I think the best way to do that when talking about Native women is to talk about kinship. Um, this is true in part because it enables us to have a conversation with students about how Native people organized their societies and structured their lives. So when I talk about kinship, um, I often bring in examples, and, and they might be quite cheesy, but they still work for college students, about if you were going to have a birthday party and you um, invited all of your family and friends, people you consider closest to you, how many people would there be? You know, some people are like, oh, 10, some people are like 100. I'm like, well, if you were from, and I use as evidence an example of a Native community in, in my region, um, you might invite this many people, and it's always in the thousands, to exemplify this idea that our modern day understandings of relatedness are unique to our time and place and don't reflect indigenous views of who belongs. And those indigenous views are rooted in a way of understanding relatedness 
that is um, both historically very unique and ongoing. And that is thinking about um, who belongs in terms of a reciprocal understanding of who has rights and who has obligations. In other words, if we were going to go back to that analogy of a birthday party, right, the idea of who's got to bring me a gift, but more important than that, who do I have to give? Who do I have to care for? I think it's a really interesting point in our very individualistic society today um, to talk about kinship in terms of socialization. Um, what happens in a society where people understand um, the welfare, um, the needs of their relatives? broadly speaking, that's more important than our, their own, and that those relationships then extend beyond human beings to the non-human world. This is one of those places where a lot of students will um, really have to challenge their stereotypes. Um, you know, college students, they've all seen Pocahontas, and they have this notion, right, of all Native people as um, inherently environmentalists and, and tree huggers who can talk to squirrels and raccoons. I'm like, well, you know, y'all, that's stereotype, right? really doesn't even get to the heart of what's important to know, which is that in kinship systems, Native folks didn't understand the natural world as distinct from the human one in terms of all beings, again, having rights and obligations to one another. And so if we think about relatedness in the broadest possible way, and we understand society not in terms of who's a citizen of a particular nation, um, who is obligated to follow the laws of it, who is obligated to take care of the other members of that group. It pivots the conversation then from um, ideas of Native people as simple or primitive to really the core values that underlie Native political systems, Native spiritual systems, and Native economies. Um, I also always point out that the majority of kinship systems in Native North America unlike elsewhere in the world, are matrilineal, meaning that folks understood themselves um, as related to one another through their maternal lines. Um, it's distinct, it's not notable, and it also explains in part why um, Native women had status and power in Native North America in ways that were different from elsewhere in the world and quite shocking to Europeans. Um, and so important then to always center when I'm talking about Native women um, their power and, and the reasons for that when I'm explaining different components of Native cultures to students. Um, Brooke, what would you like to add to that? I think you covered it uh, fairly broadly and well. Um, so in talking about traditional families, especially matrilineal families. Um, these families have bonds between siblings, and siblings can include or be identified as cousins. Um, the relationship between elders of the family and the children, these are relationships that are really come first within um, what we might consider a nuclear family. But these traditional families, um, they're much more extended. And as Rose was saying previously, you know, this idea of reciprocity and generosity, it was commonplace among early Native Americans. Um, and gender is complementary, where men were never viewed as superior to women, nor were women superior to men. It was um, a level playing field for both. And it was important, that kind of balance was really important to uh, maintaining balance within their communities, their societies. Um, and it, after all, it took both women and men to ensure the survival of a tribe, a band. Um, so 
everyone is looking out for the well-being of the nation or the tribe, and they're looking out for one another. Um, so, um, Rose, did you want to add anything to this? I mean, a lot of what I just said is repetitive from um, the kinship slide. I'll add that one of the ways that I, I bring this into my lessons is to think about, um, particularly at the points in like my U.S. history survey, right, which is, you know, kind of the, the, the main concepts that we expect students to understand and learn. And so, for example, when I get to something like the Trail of Tears or, um, you know, the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Plains War, I begin with a discussion of family structure um, and removal in terms of folks in the Native South uh, and the Plains Wars in terms of groups like the Lakota and the Cheyenne. Um, because when we talk about family and we talk about how Native societies traditionally were structured um, to center the welfare of children and to center the welfare of elders, um, it, it makes sense then to talk about some of the decisions that Native leaders make when they make decisions to fight and how to fight, but also when they make decisions not to fight. Um, one of the main questions that, that I feel all the time from students is, you know, why didn't Native people unify in like one giant group and, and fight? Um, well, you know, in many cases, that didn't make sense because of traditional animosities, but also when the survival of your children is, is your central goal. And you, you can't look forward in time and understand what's coming in terms of the boarding school system, in terms of um, the incredible poverty that was created on reservations by the U.S. government. But you're thinking in the moment in terms of how do I get my children to the, to the next year of their life? Is fighting or is negotiating going to get me there? Um, if you understand the centrality of the welfare of children and elders, um, to Native societies, then, then it makes sense um, often to talk about really hard decisions that they make. Again, when we're talking about some of these really hard uh, experiences in history, such as removal, such as warfare. Um, so that gets us to um, some of the, uh, the sources that we asked you to look at prior to tonight's workshop. Um, and we picked this podcast, well, we, we love it, it's a great series, so hopefully if you're uh, somebody who is still doing your cardio and you're looking for something good to listen to, you're, you're going to enjoy this. Um, but, you know, there are, are many great theoretical articles on um, identity, um, on indigenous feminism, <laughs> but I like this podcast, I wish we like this podcast, um, because it's fun and it's real, real, and it tells us how important this sense of relatedness is to Native peoples today. Um, I combined it with Clara Sue Kidwell's article. It's a, a little bit older now. Um, and it's about how to teach Native history, excuse me, how to write Native history by talking about family. Um, but I often use this piece in workshops with speakers. So I think it's really important for us to think about how to teach Native history by centering Native families. Um, not the political units that the United States government thought were important, certainly not the, the military leaders that often get emphasized. Um, and so in thinking then about how you might introduce um, Native history to your students by centering relatedness and relationships, are there ways that you think you can do that? Are there moments in your classes? Are there, there things that come to mind? And I'd love to see some examples in the chat of if you pivot from particular events to the relationships among those people involved in them, how might that change your class or what might you talk about? And Brooke, feel free to jump in with any other examples about why we picked this. Uh, Professor, I do have uh, a question that's come from the floor. This is from Leah, who is joining us from Minnesota tonight. Uh, Leah is wondering if you have any specific examples of individuals who might have been dissatisfied with their gender roles, however complementary, and how that was handled within the broader society uh, intertribal conflicts. 
in my own research, I do not find that. Um, but I think there are other tribes within North America that had more than this binary of women and men. Um, they had this two-spirit people, which the two-spirit people is a more 21st century, late 20th, tw early 21st century um, identity. And um, they occupied a very uh, reverent position within their tribes. Um, That makes sense. Thank you. So to echo what Brooke was saying, especially in, in teaching about gender diversity, um, and this is something that in the time that I've been teaching, let's see, I started teaching in uh, 2005. Uh, feels like it's been a minute. <laughs> more and more of my students um, do not identify as male or female, um, but um, understand themselves to be um, folks who are expressing their gender identity in a range of unique ways. And so I've incorporated more of the scholarship on this in my Native history classes. And one of the, the resources that we've shared with you all is um, a piece on an Apache person named Lo Zen, who uh, defied the, the fairly strict roles for female people in Apache society, um, but did so in ways that enable us to understand how people um, who were gender diverse traditionally in Native societies were not penalized for not being either or because they were both and. Um, and in societies that are structured around ideas of gender complementarity, um, male and female are considered as um, indeed opposite, but um, the space in between then is not a space of, of stigma or taboo, but a space of power because those people who are in between can access power of folks, but they also communicate between the majority, which are folks who fill the roles of males and folks who fill the roles of females. A great example of that is in the other piece that I posted um, in those resources, which is um, a, a piece about Lenape country, so hey folks in Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, and that's about this village um, that a, a Moravian missionary named Zeisberger visits in the colonial period, and he's like basically having a panic attack because it's a village without people that he identifies as male. And what he doesn't see is that the female people in that village are caring for one another according to the concepts of kinship, but it's that their male relatives, their brothers, or their, their cousins who they consider to be siblings, are, are present in their lives. And so it's that they don't have husbands, which of course he thinks is just a, a terrible sin um, and a, a reason for the you know, Moravian submission to these folks. Um, but it shows us that when we think about kinship again at the core of Native societies, is that you know, one didn't need to have a husband to serve in one, or be female in one's community, and one didn't need to have a wife to be male that one's roles in terms of gender were determined by um, the work that one did for one's kin, um, one's understanding of, of one's spiritual purpose in life. And so gender isn't about um, one person's genitals or sexual desires, so much as it's about, again, that system of rights and obligations. Um, and that means that not everyone in uh, a Native community, and certainly the Lenape article is a great example of that, had to be a biological mother or biological father. They could still be a part of their kin group and serve those important roles um, without having to take on some of the, the roles that we today associate very strongly with gender in terms of marriage um, and parenting. That's a great question and absolutely one that's so much, rele so much more relevant to our students uh, today even than it was I said, 15 years ago. Fantastic, thank you. So traditional ecological knowledge. Um, what this is basically about is a relationship between uh, a society and the land, the natural resources on the land. Um, and so 
we've all heard the word sustainability and it means different things to different people. But when we think of, um, when we think about Native Americans or indigenous people and this kind of um, saving of natural resources or fighting against pollution, we most of us, I would imagine, think back to that old commercial in the 70s of um, the Indian man standing alongside the road watching someone throw trash on the road with a tear running down his eye. Um, so we're not, why I'm mentioning that is because the traditional way of looking at this is that all Indians are environmental. Well, it's deeper than that because it's about these relationships and maintaining balance um, between human beings and animals and non-animated uh, things like rocks or trees. And this, what this results in um, is certain practices, certain ceremonial settings, especially uh, one that you can use as an example is that of a um, indigenous hunter as he goes out and maybe he kills a deer and instead of just picking the deer up and carrying it home, He's there with the deer, giving thanks to the deer for giving up its life. Um, so it's about um, kind of sustaining knowledge, knowledge that has been passed down from generation to generation. Um, and each society has their own traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. Um, and most Native people, they conceptualize this all as kind of the circle um, where life is constantly going in a circle. Um, and so I'll give you an example, another example about the sustainability. And this is from the 1800s where Catawba women would go out and harvest herbs to treat for medicinal reasons. Maybe they want to treat uh, rheumatism or maybe they want to treat uh, wound. Well, they never took all of the herb or the plant that they needed. They made sure they either left some or um, replanted it in another place. So they were never without that uh, plant. Um, so it's like this human symbiotic relationship with a natural environment. Rose, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, Brooke, I, I think that's, well, I'll say the only thing I'd add is that I always use TK to relate things back to kinship, but I love your explanation. And um, as I put in the chat, I'm plugging the first chapter of your book, which is a fabulous discussion of TEK among the Catawba, um, but one of the best I've read about the Native South in particular. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so from my point of view, in terms of Catawbas, they start off with this immense amount of land that's available to them. And they use the resources on there and they change the environment. They have um, forest 
forest burns. They have game fires where they create these circles of fire to draw the deer inside of that circle um, and then, you know, kill it. Um, but this, even though Catawba's land base shrank over the years, they still comp continued to practice these um, sustainability, if you want to identify it, that sustainability processes um, that in turn help with our resilience, our um, survival as a people. Thanks, Brooke. Um, one of the ways that TEK is also useful in the classroom is that food sovereignty um, and activism around um, the restoration of traditional food systems, um, which of course ties into environmental activism, is incredibly um, important to most Native nations today. And so one of the, the material or the, the sources of material that you can most likely find through a quick Google search <laughs> it might be um, everything from uh, efforts of your local Native nations to um, provide traditional seeds to citizens of their nation or um, the, the planting of gardens, the, the education of folks about traditional foods and how to prepare them. And of course, this leads us into conversations about public health and wellness and the, and the negative impact of uh, colonization and you know, U.S. government policies around health and welfare and economics on, on Native people's physical bodies. So TEK then is a useful concept, not just to um, bridge ideas about kinship and family, of course, understanding Native people, but then also, as we said at the beginning, you know, to talk about present-day issues is important. And this is one of those issues that, that is important in different ways to different Native nations. Um, but I can't think of a different native of a native nation that's not engaged in some work around food sovereignty or environmental preservation um, around food resources, um, and especially um, those that uh, have folks who are willing to um, either today on Zoom or you know come give presentations. That's often a, a really easy and accessible way um, to introduce students to the native cultures and histories of your region is through these conversations about food. Um, and the environment. Um, I've got a quick question for you that's come in. Uh, either one of you can take this. Um, this question comes from Sonia. Uh, Sonia is in Syracuse at St. John's University, and uh, she's wondering if you have used any um, matrilineal texts or indigenous theory texts in your teaching, and she specifically quotes or references Paula Gunn Allen, James Welch, uh, Linda Hogan, uh, Lucy Tapahanzo, uh, Joy Harho. Uh, have you used any of these in your teaching? So I'll jump in um, to teach a, native, a class on Native women. Um, I do begin that class with a module on theory that talks about indigenous feminism, uh, and I draw in scholarship um, from beyond historians that talk a lot, or the students read anthropologists um, in particular, but also folks uh, rooted in indigenous studies. I, I often end with novels. I think it's important for students um, in history classes to have as much exposure to different Native voices as possible. And so we watch a lot of documentaries, but we also read novels written by, by Native women. Um, and so, yeah, we read uh, Linda Hogan, but um, I've been... Uh, especially in the last few modules, and now I'm, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing, I'm totally blanking on the name of the author, um, wrote The Roundhouse, she, <laughs> Brooke, help me out. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. This is what happens each all day, y'all know how it is, like my brain's just like, geez, right now, um, because I've been emphasizing um, the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and sexual violence in my classes, so um, I try to assign a novel that, again, connects to a current affair um, that, that's 
relevant and important to the Native people in this region and to Native folks in North Carolina, where Davidson is. Um, there have been several high profile um, disappearances and violent homicides of Native women. So that, that's why I choose the, the novel that I'm currently teaching. Um, but absolutely, those are important resources and another great way to, to incorporate current events into a class. That's fantastic, thank you. So this is Brooke and I'll uh, chime in here with the um, land dis disposition. It was, it is a gendered and violent process. Um, so for the most part, sexual violence was uncommon or unheard of in most Native societies uh, before European arrival. Um, gender violence did exist, and it was structured within the kinship system. So um, in my case, you have, or in, um, my research, you have um, women pre-European arrival or early contact period. Um, if they committed adultery, their uh, noses, their nose was cut from their face. Um, the man didn't receive any punishment. Um, not physical punishment like the woman did. But it was as horrible as it sounds. It was their way of keeping good and evil separated. Now, sexual violence does become more normalized as part of uh, colonization. Uh, and this comes from the combination of the English common law and the doctrine of discovery. So rape, um, abuse, any other abuse against Native women, this was a primary tool of Europeans to separate the native people from their land. And women were especially, they had an intimate tie to the land because most of the matrilineal uh, nations, they had a female, an original female ancestor who was tied to the land. Um, and so because women do the agricultural work, they take care of the, the towns, and because they're responsible for giving birth to a, a new generation, um, conquest of the women, whether it's rape or otherwise, um, it also was symbolic of conquest of land. Um, today, Native, Native women uh, across the United States, they experience violence at the hands of their perpetrators. Um, and they, they have the highest rate of sexual violence than any other group in the United States. And a lot of times their perpetrators go unpunished. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the uh, jurisdictional loopholes um, and prejudice against Indians uh, in a way that, you know, it, it's somewhat, it's sad the way they uh, phrase it, and it's um, ironic too. Most 
um, non-native people are afraid that if Indians or native people have control and are able to punish a non-native per perpetrator, then they'll just, they won't follow the law. They'll just go after that person. And, you know, you turn, you flip that over to the United States legal system and you have to ask the same question that they are asking of Native, um, Native American court system. How can you be fair? Well, the Native American judges go through the same process as the other judges. They have to pass a bar. They are taught the law is, as it is of the land. Um, and I think this is just one way of keeping, um, keeping control, if you want to say, of Native American tribal governments. Um, Rose, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, Brooke. Um, so again, I'm thinking about how to tie past events to current affairs. One of the things that I do for students when we talk about sexual violence, which um, in addition to teaching a Native women's history course, I teach a, an upper level a senior seminar on the history of rape. So um, this is a topic that I spend a lot of time talking about, is that the, the core concepts that underlie colonization in terms of the doctrine of discovery or the right of discovery, the right of conquest as it evolves, um, or a denial of native sovereignty over their land. Um, a second component is, is the denial of native political leadership, and therefore the denial of the rights of, of native people to have laws of their own that are respected by settler governments. Um, that exact construct is what underlies the fundamental jurisdictional issues that enable Native women today to be raped at a rate higher than any other group in the United States. Um, some estimates are that three or four Native women um, alive today experience sexual violence, and that the majority, if not most of them, um, are assaulted by non-Native perpetrators. And because tribal governments um, today, right now, do not have jurisdiction over non-tribal members um, who engage in criminal behavior on tribal land, on reservation land, that means that the burden of investigating, of prosecuting, of, of heading out justice, whatever that means, falls to the federal government. And they haven't done that, and they don't do that. Um, the, the 2013 re-up of the Violence Against Women Act sought to address that um, one of the resources that we've shared with you is um, an article by a woman named Sarah Deer, um, Sarah with an H. Um, if you want to Google her, she was a MacArthur Fellow a couple years back, so a genius. I mean, she's super smart. And the thing that she figured out is that um, these legal loopholes and the ways that Native nations can respond to them are to create their own um, systems of redress within their communities. And so her book, that came uh, out of that year that the MacArthur Fellowship provided her the right called The Beginning and End of Rape. Um, and for anyone who cares about Native rights, but anyone who cares about issues of sexual violence and women's rights, it's a phenomenal read. Um, and it talks about how these issues that, that are literally rooted in 1492 play out today in real and tangible ways. Um, and again, are one of the primary means um, or primary um, focuses of indigenous activism. So at this point in my class, I would always say to my students, okay, you know, go on social media and look up the hashtag MMIW, right? Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Um, and the, the ways in which Native communities today are mobilizing around this issue precisely because it has been ongoing since 1492. So that gets us to, um, Talking about HCR or historical trauma response, um, this is a useful concept, especially in trying to help students understand um, how to think about 
some of the issues of concern that, that they may know about Native nations today. And so um, students in my class, we often have talked about the, the reasons, like literally the federal government policies that create poverty, but they also often come in with assumptions based especially on um, television or, or movies that they've seen about high rates of violence in Native communities, of drug abuse, of, of suicide, especially among young people. And so I include discussions of HTR to help students understand that these aren't individual incidents that are reflecting um, isolated human beings, but rather to help them understand um, systemic um, trauma and to think about how historical events, and in particular, um, repeated and ongoing losses. That can be the losses of loved ones to disease or to warfare. It can be the loss of autonomy, um, the ability of adults to, to feed and provide for children, and elders in the ways that they traditionally had. I mean, that's reservations in a nutshell, right? Our, our um, places where Native people can't provide for themselves and are structured by an economy that requires their economic dependence on the federal government. Um, and over generations, the, those experiences have a consequence. And the consequences um, are, again, high rates of everything from um, physical sickness. You know, we think about high rates of diabetes, um, of autoimmune conditions, of cancers, of mental health concerns in Native communities, um, to high rates of self-harm and high rates of abuse of one's loved ones. Um, and in thinking about HCR, again, it's, it's a concept that's useful because there's a lot of scholarship about it, um, but it's also a concept that helps us understand that there are real consequences to the history that we study. That if we think about Native communities um, as people who in many situations have been intentionally disempowered, what does that look like? when we want to think about how perhaps to build a better nation and the ways that we can empower um, Americans to make decisions for themselves. And I always end my classes with asking students, like, especially if you're non-Native, what, what can you do to empower and amplify Native voices? Um, Brooke, did you want to add anything before we jump into the resilience slide? No, I think that covers it. Great. So um, as we said at the beginning, when we talk about trauma, we always end with talking about resilience. It's a, a best practice from trauma-informed teaching methods. And so that's why we asked you as well uh, to think about or to, to watch that short video um, about jingle dress dancing. And so uh, in case you uh, haven't gotten enough of it, it's a gorgeous picture of one of those um, dresses and Brooke's going to start on this slide and then we're going to talk a little bit about that short video by Brenda Child. So yeah, resilience of uh, Native American communities. This is, you know, as we've mentioned um, throughout this hour, um, it's based on cultural knowledge um, that really informs younger generations to be proud of who they are and where they come from. So th it includes anything from community history, um, which is oral tradition, often oral tradition, um, cultural intuition, and that idea of reciprocity where um, you have a responsibility, not just to the community, but to other members or citizens outside of your um, your main family structure. Um, and this kind of reciprocity and kinship can uh, spill over to those who are adopted early on um, in in American history. Um, so I'll, I know we're short on time, so I will let Rose go ahead with the next slide. 
Thanks, Brooke. Um, the only thing that I add in teaching about resilience, um, and I, I guess this might be a, a more relevant concept today than ever, is that I talk about it with my students and like it's a, a cultural vaccine. And that um, resilience isn't something that um, we think about only after the fact in terms of trauma, that certainly um, there are um, efforts ongoing today and uh, there are so many great examples. This is another place where you can bring in um, information about the present day to your students. Um, I can think about examples from, for example, the Northwest Coast, um, Canoe Waves, which is um, an annual gathering um, of Native people from the Pacific Northwest that focuses on um, the, the traditional intertribal diplomacy, but also the, the practices of constructing canoes, of, of learning how to maneuver them, um, of feasting, of gifting one another. Um, here in the Southeast, there are multiple uh, events um, associated with different Native communities. Um, for example, the Cherokee do a remembering removal um, bike ride where folks um, ride from the Carolinas to Oklahoma, learning their history um, and studying the, their genealogy for individual participants along the way. And that these kinds of events are, are so important for Native people, um, but they're also important for non-Native people to understand the purpose of them. Um, often, you know, as a non-Native person, um, I see myself as someone who watches these as an outsider, but the importance of acknowledging that these kinds of events are about healing past traumas, but also about protecting young people and Native communities, and especially thinking, again, as we mentioned, the high rates of um, depression, of drug use, of um, family violence in Native communities, is that supporting these things with our presence, with our money, but also when our students want to participate in them and be a part of them, um, being flexible and accommodating. You know, for me, as somebody who teaches college, I, I have to accommodate student athletes. I always say to my Native students, like, you want to do your cultural stuff? You go. You do it. <laughs> um, because that's exactly the purpose of these kinds of events, um, both to heal and, and to inoculate for um, future traumas. And so we chose then um, a great example of um, a particular cultural practice that, that has ties in um, a traumatic historical event, right? The, the flu pandemic of 1918. Um, but that's also very real and very relevant today, both in terms of healing from sickness, but also political activism, um, activism from um, uh, raising awareness about missing and murdered indigenous women to um, standing rock and environmental issues. Um, but if you uh, Google um, jingle dress dancers and George Floyd, you will see that there were Native women from the American Indian Movement in Minneapolis, right, who were, who were dancing to commemorate um, Mr. Floyd and to address the pain and suffering um, of folks uh, in Minneapolis this past summer. And so um, in thinking then about how to end your classes and end um, teaching moments about Native women with present day voices, um, this is one example of how we talk about resilience. So finding a current present day cultural practice. Uh, are there things from the communities where you teach um, from the Native peoples in your home communities that come to mind? Is there, is there something that you can give an example of in the chat? Or even thoughts on, on Brenda's great video and how she connects the history of the flu to what's going on right, right now. And we'll give folks uh, a chance to respond to that question, Rose. And while we're asked, waiting for their responses, uh, I wonder if you could also speak a little bit to, uh, you've talked, both of you have talked a lot about essentially unteaching some of the stereotypes and mythologies. Uh, I assume that in many cases, particularly, Rose, you talked about your own classes at Davidson. I would assume that's from non-Native students. Tell us a little bit about some of the stereotypes or agency that you'd like to encourage in Native students. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, I've had really different teaching experiences in spending 10 years in the Lumbee community where sometimes I would be the only non-Native person in the room and you know, there's, a, there's a different politics to that. Um, 
the teaching at Davidson, which is a historically Presbyterian institution and one that teaches very privileged, mostly white students. Um, students come into my class, if they've had an experience with Native people, it's almost always a high school mission trip. And so I have learned from the beginning of my class to, to have them write a reflective essay in which they talk about what they know, what they bring in. Um, right behind mission trips are um, Indian mascots, whether it's from their uh, high school or um, K through eight school or um, a mascot of a, a sports team at the national level um, that they follow. And it's interesting to me, but almost always in a distant third um, is media in terms of movies or television shows. Um, more so now, I'm seeing folks who are aware of uh, Native activism on social media. And that's, that's important and that's interesting. And I think that's a reflection of the prominence of Standing Rock for, for young people of this generation. Um, but that also comes with this downside because they then think that um, change is driven in Native communities by protests and by demonstrations. And that's true in some cases, but um, great example, the, the resource that we posted um, uh, by Brenda Child um, on uh, Native women's organizing in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or um, Wilma Mankiller's biography in the documentary about her provide alternative perspectives that, that really center um, what's the core theme of Native women's work for social change which is grassroots activism behind the scenes. So for every high profile demonstration of the Red Power Movement in you know, the 1970s, you know, there were years of Native woman, women who were organizing to feed the community, to educate children, to provide health care. Um, and so if we think of, for example, something like Standing Rock today in terms of the images that we may see on social media, we're also losing sight of all of the activism that goes on behind the scenes and a whole lot of that is being done by Native women. Some of the same women who've been doing that work since the Red Power era of the 1970s. Um, and a great uh, film uh, that, again, we posted the link to in our resources is Warrior Women that makes the connection between those generations, the Red Power generation and the current one. And a lot of that knowledge of, of both how to organize, but also the spiritual traditions driving it are transmitted through mothers and grandmothers. So you know, women, again, are the center of the story. Mm, fantastic. Uh, Leah, again, in Minneapolis has, a, uh, I think, a good question for you to address. Um, she notes that she often hears the term resistance when used, uh, used when teaching about people of color, but you're using the word resilience tonight. Can you talk a little bit about the difference? Yeah, I can um, speak to this a, a little bit. Um, so resistance is usually, it usually occurs when somebody is being acted upon. Um, and so using resilience um, places the power back in the hands of Native people. Um, it helps to show how they responded and how they adapt to the world around them. Um, and this kind of resilience has been an ongoing for hundreds of years. Um, and Native people across North America, Canada, um, they have been adapting to enormous change significant change um, for centuries. Rose, do you want to add to that? So I don't have a good answer for why the term resilience is just used particularly in indigenous studies or native studies today, except to say that it comes to me as a historian from folks who are working in um, the more people helping fields, the social work, um, child psychology in particular in education. Um, there's a great book that we included in our list of resources by a Lakota scholar named Hilary Weaver called Trauma and Resilience in the Lives of Contemporary Native Americans. And um, it's a textbook that, that does a great job summarizing the current scholarship 
both on um, HTR, um, so how we can understand trauma, but also um, how we can understand resilience as um, a construct, but also a practice. And so for me, as someone who teaches classes, that, that often touch on some really difficult stuff that may impact my students that I to teach a class on the history of race, um, I found this to be a great read, not just from a theoretical perspective, but also that informed practices that I use in my classroom um, to support the young people that I work with. And again, uh, that's Hillary Weaver's book, and it's one of the, the resources that we listed on that guide. Fantastic, thank you. Um, here's a question from Tisha. Tisha is joining us from Connecticut. Uh, Tisha asks, um, what do you think about the role of truth and reconciliation committees in terms of healing and resistance? Uh, it, at least in the way she's thinking, um, many of those have been organized in places like Maine to address the state's uh, adoption practices. Um, this is Rose. So one of the resources that we posted is to the documentary about um, what's going on in Maine so that relates to this question. Um, I'm, I've not been party to um, a, doc, a Truth and Reconciliation Committee that is about Indigenous experiences. And so while I've been um, a student of reading about them, both um, the national one as it, as it uh, unfolded in Canada, but also what's going on in Maine now. Um, and I think it's important for non-Native people like myself, um, especially those who teach Native students and teach about Native people to understand the ways that Native people uh, experience the impact of colonization and this history. Um, but I also come to this as someone who is part of Davidson College's efforts um, to understand the truth about our history associated with slavery and, and to reconcile with that and to be right in the future. Um, I was on that, that committee and um, I think my job as a white person is to listen and I think my job as a white person is to talk to other white people. And in the sense, or in the case where these commissions or committees serve that purpose, they're good and they're productive. To the extent that some of these commissions, both about indigenous people and, and I think about issues um, on slavery, uh, serve in place of substantive change, then I think it's the white folks in the room who need to shut them down. <laughs> I've been a part of those two. Um, and so I come to them with hope, but I also come to them with suspicion when words are not followed with action and when policies that are meaningful don't come from all of the truth that, that those folks who were hurt and are hurting share as part of these commissions and committees. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, this one's from Sonia. Sonia asks, are topics such as migration and restorative justice and diversity uh, integral to centering indigenous womanhood? I think those um, that is really important in centering womanhood. Number one, diversity, because not all Native women are alike. Not all respond to events in the same way. Um, and what were the other two? Um, I apologize. I, I already closed the question, but I think it was about restorative justice, um, okay. migra migration, and uh, oh, migration. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, in teaching about migration patterns for um, of Native Americans uh, in the South, I I tell my students that they're occupation of a land was not um, it was not thought of in the same way that um, early Europeans thought about land as a commodity 
Instead, these lands were used communally. And the women were very careful about avoiding soil exhaustion. And so they could move their towns anywhere from 10 to 15 years, every 10 to 15 years, um, to prevent that from ha happening. Um, and so that was just one way of taking care of the land around them. Um, and so migration was really important to this land management or stewardship. Thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes and I would encourage our audience to drop any more questions that you might like us to address in the Ask Professors Strimlau and Bauer. Um, here's a question from Jennifer Nichols. Uh, Jennifer is wondering if there are any, any resources for Native American voices that might be similar to uh, other resources you find online, digital archives that contain oral histories of in her example, Latin American migrants in North Carolina, or I'm sure many of our teachers around the country can uh, can note or to cite uh, an archive where they can find these kinds of voices. What's a great voice uh, resource for Native American voices? So in the resources that we provided, there's two things that I'd say are good places to start your journey on this. One is um, Debbie Reese uh, has an amazing blog, which is about American Indians and children's literature. And, and I mean, honestly, that, that title does not do this blog justice because what she's done over the years is curated an amazing amount of material um, that enables folks to search using the, the key terms on the right-hand margin by native groups, but also by topics. Um, and her reviews of materials, everything from picture books for little ones to books written for um, the high school level are very thoughtful. She reaches out to scholars from those communities, um, to community people, and so brings in a lot of Native voices and a lot of expertise that doesn't come with PhD right after the name. And, and I think that's the real expertise a lot of times that, that we need to listen to. The other resource that we shared is from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And so a handful of years ago, a group of Native educators in this state created that resource. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of it, what they did is include a bunch of links to comparable efforts in other states, but also resources created by um, national Native educator organizations, organizations or groups that are working on particular topics. And so um, while the materials that they provide are helpful, that list of resources also is a really good one to go to to jump in and to try to identify things that may be relevant to the age range that you're working with or the region or the particular topics that you want to introduce to your students. Great. Um, I think this likely will be the last question. This comes from Roberto, and he's curious if you can talk some as best you can about the reaction by indigenous people to President Biden's recent choice and nomination of Deb Halen to head the Department of Interior. Um, not only talk maybe a little bit about their reaction, but what kinds of policy changes do you imagine she might uh, implement? Um, so this is Rose again, and thinking about her significance, it's important to understand that the Bureau of Indian Affairs at the end of the day is not created to serve Native people. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs today is located within the Department of the Interior. Um, it began as the Indian Office located in the Department of War, and that should tell us a whole lot about the purpose of this particular component of the federal government. That being said, I think the fact that Deb Salon has been nominated that there are more Native women serving in office at the federal and at state levels today than there ever have been, and Native men too, is incredibly important. Um, but I feel like if we put all of our hope into um, the Secretary of the Interior changing, or hopefully she'll be uh, 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 approved by the Senate, the Secretary of the Interior um, changing the course of federal Indian policy um, we're putting too much pressure on one person and not taking responsibility to vote folks into office who understand this history 
and in particular, how to support Native communities. Um, and this goes back even to uh, that concept of the doctrine of discovery or right of discovery and right of conquest. Um, the United States government, since a series of court cases in the 1820s, 20s, and 30s, has understood itself um, as the uh, guardian to Native peoples and their lands and resources. Um, one of the resources I dropped in the chat um, uh, podcast series, series called, this, called This Land talks about this legal history in a really wonderful and intelligible way. Um, the, the shortest way to describe it is to say that the federal government believes it's the rightful authority over Native land and resources. And as important as it is to have um, the voice of Native people at the table in terms of serving on the cabinet, that's not going to change no matter who is the department or who heads the Department of the Interior until federal law changes and until the federal courts um, start making different kinds of decisions when cases on native land, especially oil, water, um, and mineral rights come before them. And so it's very, very important. It's very symbolically important. Um, I have hope in her abilities to um, move us in the right direction, but it's on everyone who votes and it's on everyone who teaches young people um, to create uh, the context for the greater change that's needed beyond one person's ability to pivot to a better um, uh, relationship between the United States and Native people. 